Family mode. Hello and welcome to CIO Index's Thought Leadership Series. Our webinar today is on internal market economics. How to implement practical IT financial and resource governance processes. We are delighted to have you we are delighted that you have chosen to participate in this interesting and important presentation. My name is Sonika Nihalani and I am your host. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. It will last for approximately 60 minutes. 45 to 50 minutes of the presentation for the presentation and the rest for your questions. You will also be asked to participate in two poll questions during this webinar, the first of which will be on your screens shortly. You have approximately one minute to answer this question. At this moment, I'd like to go over some housekeeping rules. If your connection is dropped at any point during this webinar, please dial back in. In the unlikely event that our connection is dropped, please wait five minutes and then dial back in. You can send me your questions at any time using the Q&A button or if you need assistance, you may use the chat button to chat with me directly. Please take a moment to answer the poll. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Dean Meyer. With decades of experience in the IT industry, Dean Meyer is one of the original proponents of running shared service organizations within companies as business within a business, where every managerial group is an entrepreneurship funded to produce products and services for customers. He has implemented this philosophy in corporate government government and non-profit organizations through the careful design of culture, organizational structure, and internal market economics. Dean is the author of seven books, numerous monographs, and countless articles. We are here to talk about his most recent book, Internal Market Economics. Dean is both a visionary and a mechanic. He paints a clear picture of how organizations should work and implements that vision through pragmatic, structured, and participative change processes. Without further ado, I present to you Mr. Dean Meyer. Welcome, Dean. It's all Thanks, yours. Monica. And thank you all for, uh, for coming. Uh, it's a delight to be back on CIO Index uh, webinar series. And I um, hope we can help you solve some of those problems that uh, you saw in the poll question. I'd like to begin, if I may, by talking about where we go wrong in the area of IT financial management and resource governance processes. And then let's take a step back and get a fresh view of how things should work. And then we'll dig down to how to implement it. And from there, I'll be open to any and all questions you might think of. But first, where do we go wrong? And I'm going to take that in two pieces. Once a year, we do a planning cycle, including budgeting and publishing our rates. And then during the year, we have governance processes. So let's start by looking at where we go wrong in the budgeting process. So here we are, ready to do our budget. Picture a spreadsheet. And the columns represent your general ledger uh, expense codes, you know, compensation, travel, training, vendor licenses, professional services, and so on. And the rows represent the deliverables you plan for the year ahead, the projects and services that you might offer to the business. Well and good, so we fill in the cells with numbers, and then the mistake that so many organizations make is they total the columns and submit a budget for compensation, travel, training, vendor services by cost center. Now, what do you expect senior management to do with that? I mean, they have to talk about something, right? And 
And what have you given them to talk about? Compensation, travel, and training? So of course they're going to come after your travel budget or whatever. You're just begging for micromanagement. You're setting yourself up for micromanagement because that's all you've given them to talk about. Meanwhile, executives don't have a clue how much travel you might need to run your business or training or anything else. You're asking them to make decisions they're really not qualified to make. After all, you're the experts in IT. You know what it takes to run this business. Meanwhile, they're not making the decisions that they ought to be making. Well, think about it. What should they be deciding at budget time? Well, how much to spend on IT, along with all the other things the business needs. What's the right answer to IT spending? Well, that's simple. We should fund all the good investments and leave behind the rest. Of course, keeping the lights on is a real good investment. And on top of that, there are probably some projects that are really worthwhile, that discretionary but worthwhile. So the idea is they should pour money into IT until they've exhausted all the really great investment opportunities and they're down to the marginal one. That is, they should fund all the investments with good ROI. But you can't judge ROI on compensation travel and training. So we're really not equipping them with the information they need to make wise judgments about IT budgets. So what do they do? Last year plus or minus a few percent, a squeaky wheel, politics. This is no way to optimize shareholder value. Meanwhile, this whole process induces game playing. You know this is true. You build in some fat. They challenge you to take it out. So you take some of the fat out and you come back and they figure there's probably a little more in there so they challenge you again, go sharpen your pencil. And at the end of the day, do we have any assurance that we've cut out all the fat and no more? How do we know we haven't cut into the bone? This is not a reliable process for determining the IT budget. It really doesn't accomplish much of anything. Well, I shouldn't say that. It accomplishes one thing. It absolutely proves in their minds that your going in position is unreliable and that you cannot be trusted. Other than that, it's just a game. At some point, they may come back and say, you cut. Well, now, we've already cut out all the easy stuff, so what are you going to do now? They say, I, I don't know how you do it, CIO. Just uh, bring it down to X. So now it's up to IT to decide what to cut out of the budget. So look, we've got CIO telling clients, well, I think, uh, Sonica, I think your project is stupid. I'm not going to put that in my budget, which is the exact opposite of customer focus and business alignment. And meanwhile, are we really in a position to judge our clients' um, ROI, why they need it? Totally inappropriate and totally the opposite of an entrepreneurial customer focused business aligned internal service provider. Meanwhile, let's, okay, so at the end of all this, you come out with a budget. It's not all you'd hope for, but it's still a lot of money to the organization. And the problem is nobody knows what it really does and does not pay for. Oh, uh, sure, we know you can't travel much, but it doesn't really tell us what we can expect of you in the way of those rows, the projects and the services. So the way the business looks at it is, hey, we gave you all that money. Now, in trade for that, we should be able to scream at you for anything we can dream of all year long, all for free. And it's your fault if you can't deliver infinite service on a fixed budget. Expectations wildly out of line with resources. So what do we start doing? What do we do in response to demand in excess of supply? Uh, we cut corners on quality and get a reputation for shoddy work. We rob Peter to pay Paul, and everything comes in late. We gain a reputation for being unreliable. Uh, we sacrifice investments in infrastructure and in innovation and even in our own training. And our infrastructure becomes obsolete. Our skills become obsolete. This is an end-of-life strategy. And it all starts with the way we do the budget. So those are some of the um, symptoms. And what I asked you to do in the poll was tell me if any of these things are affecting your organization. Expectations out of line with resources, you see where that comes from, the traditional budget process. Do more with less, well, we don't know what things really cost, so that comes out of the budget process. Vague accusations that you cost too much. A lack of understanding of the value you deliver, the projects and services that we value. All we know is you're a big black hole for money an unreliable source of funding for infrastructure and innovation. The other kinds of symptoms we see out of a, a poorly designed budget process, the micromanagement we mentioned, 
clients feeling out of control, such that they can't decide what IT produces for them. And that, of course, leads to poor alignment with their needs. And internally, we may see a culture that, uh, that is the opposite of customer focus and entrepreneurship, more of a defensive, my job is to get money to feed my people, not serve the business. So Sonica, let me ask you, what did we get back from the poll? Which of these issues are of concern to our attendees? Sonica, I'm sorry, I can't see that screen. I bet they can, and I can't. What should I do? Um, let me just read it out to you. We had uh, about 71% of our audience today that participated in this poll. Uh, a large number of them, 65%, uh, went with and you know the second choice that they are expected to do more for less. 50% believe that client expectations I exceed their resources, and uh, just about 25% believe that funding for infrastructure and innovation is unreliable. Um, and, and and you know it's between clients not appreciating the value that they deliver and accusing them of costing too much so okay so a and b are the big ones not the big ones not surprising i see this all over clients expect more of us and it's our fault when we can't deliver infinite service on a fixed budget and that do more with less can you really do more with less folks well, sure, if you've got people sitting around wasting time and money, you just tell them to stop wasting time and money and you do more with less. Nonsense, right? You've been driving cost savings year over year, all these years. You don't have people sitting around wasting time and money. If we're going to be given less funding, we're going to do less with less. And the only interesting question is, how do we decide what that less is? But I think at this point, you see that all of these symptoms come down to the same root cause the way we present our budget. We total the columns instead of the rows. Now then what happens during the year? During the year, we've been given this budget, and um, there are governance processes that decide what we use it for and track us against it, that uh, decide priorities and track spending. So let's take a look at those. Here's the old paradigm, the opposite of business within a business. We give you the budget. And watch out, here comes the trap. It's yours to manage as you see fit, CIO. Do the best you can with it. We don't really understand what to expect of you in the way of deliverables. It's your job, CIO, to align with the business. Now, that puts the CIO in a very, or the whole IT organization, in a very awkward position of having to judge client, the, the merit of clients' requests and decide priorities. And it, means that everything's free to clients, so they're demanding more and more and expecting you to deliver for free. So that leads to the need for some sort of demand management process. And it may start out with the CIO uh, trying to decide priorities. Uh, I met one CIO years ago who said, well, if, if I just become difficult to do business with, then that'll chase away all the um, unimportant stuff and the important stuff will rise to the top absurd, but he actually said that. So he put in place all kinds of request forms and bureaucracy. And ultimately, there may be a steering committee that prioritizes the major projects. The major projects, what is that, 20, 30 percent of your budget? So 70 or 80 percent of your budget is still um, not visible. Don't know why you cost so much. Um, black hole for money. Don't understand the value delivered. So yeah, it's keep the lights on, but maybe there's some lights in there that need to be turned off. No visibility on that. But even worse, the steering committee, all these executives get together and they prioritize the major projects, and then they go on expecting them all in that order because they really don't know where to draw the line. They don't have a finite checkbook, and they don't know the true cost to shareholders, taxpayers, or donors of those items in the portfolio. So as a governance process, all it really seems to do is rally all your critics together and get them to scream at you in unison. I don't think that's what we meant by governance. And then the old paradigm, just to make matters worse, how about if we allocate our costs to the business? We put our costs in these big pools and divide them by some high-level factors like headcount or revenues or transaction volumes of some major applications and stick it to the business. Now, from the client's point of view, they're getting hit with a cost 
for high-level drivers. These are not things that they can choose to buy or not buy. So they can't really decide and manage demand based on high-level allocations. They can't decide what to buy and not buy, so it's not going to improve the quality of our priorities or our decision making. And there's no way to benchmark this against outsourcing or Gartner benchmarks or anything else. So um, it's just this number that hits their bottom line. They see it as taxation without representation. And I think here in the States we fought a war over that. So of course they're going to come back at you and say, this is not fair. My allocation is too big. How can I control it? Hey, CIO, you really don't need those relationship managers. You really don't need that enterprise architecture function. They're trying to control that cost by meddling. But they've got to control that cost in some way because it's hitting their bottom line. Allocations generate resentment and mistrust and invite micromanagement. So more symptoms of traditional budget processes, uh, of traditional financial processes. One more set of symptoms we, we might look at, and that is cost control. So obviously, we need to control spending. And the traditional approach is to control supply, to put the squeeze on IT to cut IT costs, to squeeze our budget as if that's going to reduce IT spending. So we cut the size of the IT uh, function. What do we cut our budget? What do we do? We start cutting internal support services that make the rest of IT more productive. It drives costs up, not down. We cut critical sustenance activities like infrastructure refresh and training. Hmm, drives costs up, not down. Cut corners on quality. Ultimately, that may save a little bit in the short term. Drives costs up, not down. Uh, cut the infrastructure and innovation investments. Not only drives costs up, but makes us unreliable in delivery. Rob Peter to pay Paul because we're struggling under more demand than we know what to do with, unreliable delivery, and who knows what impact that has on business costs when we fail to deliver the services and the applications and tools they depend on. Uh, we find ourselves with no time for customers. We're just scrambling to deliver all the projects and services on our plate. And who knows what opportunities we've missed out there for um, strategic use of IT really impacting bottom line of the business for lack of that customer intimacy and being really engaged at that level. And we try to work our staff harder and harder. Boy, what does that do? It chases away the good people, and those who are left are burnt out, cynical, and turnover goes up. All of that adds to drive costs up. So the traditional view of cost control, cutting supply without cutting demand, is typically backfires and does just the opposite, it makes us a more expensive provider. And then we hold IT accountable for budget variances. So I want you to picture two people. Jane here is an IT manager who's really entrepreneurial, and her clients love her, and her service is great. She's uh, out there really benefiting the business, so her clients want more and more and more. And they somehow come up with the money and transfer it to Jane, fee-for-service transfers, in order to get more of her stuff. And she uses that money to hire contractors and vendors, expanding supply to meet funded demand. And she delivers more, and the clients are happy. But wait a minute. She spent more than planned. That's a budget variance, Jane. You've got some explaining to do. Meanwhile, Joe over here doesn't produce much of anything for anybody. But he spends exactly what he said he was going to spend. Oh, good boy, Joe. No budget variance. Isn't that perverse? It comes from managing people to spending variances rather than to bottom line, to break even, to value delivered. So I'd like to take, at this point, take a step back and see where all these problems, uh, we, we know where all these problems are coming from. Let's see what we can do about it. And here, well, you heard Sonica's introduction, so you know me. I always start with the business within a business paradigm. IT is a business within a business. And indeed, every manager within IT is an entrepreneur running a little business within a business there to serve customers, whether they're within IT or clients out there in the business. So clients are our marketplace. Now, what does market economics mean? In the world as a whole, what does market economics mean? It means that customers own spending power. When you go to the grocery store, it's your checkbook. You decide what you buy with it. You're accountable for living within your means and you're accountable for your purchase decisions. 
So if I go to the store and use my weekly allowance to buy a bunch of junk food, I bring that home, well, my wife won't let me go to the store again. Actually, that worked out rather well, didn't it? Just joking. Customers are in control of what they buy. So what is the job of the store? Suppliers strive to be the vendor of choice. Their job is to offer a relevant and innovative catalog and to be the best deal in town. That is not always the lowest cost, but the, the lowest cost for a given level of quality, the best value at a given level of quality. To obviously, to deliver impeccably and to build great relationships. That's how the market works out there. So how do we apply this inside of companies? Well, every group within IT sells, and I put sales in quote because I don't, I'm, I'm not going to be an advocate of chargebacks. I'm not talking about money changing hands. So sells, whether or not money changes its hands, every group sells products and services. And the price of those is the full cost to shareholders, taxpayers, or donors. We're pricing at cost, that is, we're a not-for-profit business within a business. As a business within a business, we sell products and services at a price that covers costs. We get revenues, we get money, not to pay our costs. We get money to buy our products and services. And it adds up to enough to pay the cost because of the way we calculated the rate. Meanwhile, internally, our customers, whether they're internal to IT or external out there in the business, our customers decide what they buy from us. So they need to own a checkbook, and they need to be um, empowered to make decisions about what checks to write. Now, that checkbook could be real money if you do fee-for-service chargebacks, or it could be a claim on your budget where they decide what that budget goes to. But in either case, they write the checks, and it's their job to live within their means. They can't spend more than they have in that checkbook, which means they are accountable for managing demand and deciding priorities within that limited checkbook. This is all real-world stuff. It's all simple stuff out there in the real world. Now the question is, how can we apply that inside of organizations to sort out all these financial and resource governance challenges? Again, I want to emphasize, you don't need chargebacks to implement internal market economics. I'm going to show you how in just a moment. But I want to caution you about chargebacks. But there are three sources of revenues, three ways money can flow through to you. One is direct budget. That is budget coming down from your boss. Boss gives it to the CIO, and CIOs distribute it to the managers, and so on. Direct budget. Another form is allocations, big bundles of money based on high-level formulas that come to you. And another is chargebacks, that is fee for service, where you buy, you pay, you don't buy, you don't pay. All three of those are sources of revenues to IT, revenues which buy products and services and cover your costs. So let's look at how this works. I'll draw you a picture. First, let's take this left-hand channel over uh, here. Clients have money and they decide to buy something and they pay you for it. That's fee-for-service. And it's pretty simple to envision market economics at play there. They buy what's worthwhile, they don't buy the rest. But now, let me jump over to direct budget. Direct budget comes down from above. So the CIO is given the budget. Some of that budget is to pay for things that we control. Some small percentage. Called, and I call these subsidies and ventures. Subsidies are things we do for the good of the enterprise as a whole, which vendors don't have to do. Things like policy, safety issues. Um, I don't mean mass market services like email and networking. That's still a client service. But things we do for the board, that's subsidies. And ventures, this is a loan from the bank to buy infrastructure or to fund innovation within IT. So those we set aside, and the CIO controls those. By the way, these are all defined very clearly in the book. But the bulk of your budget coming down from above is intended to benefit the business. So imagine that we just think of that a different way. Instead of thinking of budget as money to pay our costs, think of it as revenues for the products and services we sell. And so what we have here, from that point of view, is prepaid revenues. Money put on deposit with us at the beginning of the year in order to pay our bills all year long. 
uh, uh, up here in New England, uh, it's been a tough winter. We use a lot of fuel oil. So here's, here's an analogy. Um, what happens is sometime in November, the truck rolls up and it fills my tank full of oil. And I get this bill for a couple thousand dollars. And well, that's a lot of money to me. So my oil company came to me and said, listen, Dean, if you just pay a few hundred dollars a month all year long, in the summer, you build up an escrow. And then when we deliver the oil, we still sell it to you at market rates, but we'll invoice the escrow account instead of invoicing you directly. The same goes on with uh, typically with property tax and insurance as part of your mortgage escrow. Well, so I'm putting money on deposit in advance all summer long, building up that escrow account. You know what? If I change oil companies in October, I take that money with me. But come November, they sell me the oil, they invoice me, and they just decrement the escrow account. That is an example of prepaid revenues. Money put on deposit in advance in that case to buy oil. So think about the budget in the same way, prepaid revenues. And now the purpose of a governance process is very clear. That steering committee has a known checkbook, a checkbook of a known quantity. And they decide what checks to write within the limits of their spending power. And now, just like fee-for-service, we're getting paid revenues for products and services at a rate calculated to cover our costs so that we're at break-even. And through that notion of treating budget as prepaid revenues and setting up a governance process to adjudicate that checkbook, you've just implemented market economics without actual money transfers still working with just direct budget. Let's look at allocations briefly. Allocations, big lump sums that come at you, taxation without um, representation, all of that controversy, all of that can be washed away with a very simple paradigm. We treat the allocation as prepaid revenues by each business unit. So now we have multiple checkbooks for each business unit that gave us an allocation. And it's up to the business unit to decide what checks to write. That is, what products and services to buy from IT with that finite amount of money. And you know what? Within a year, they're going to come back and say, my allocation is too small. Not too big, too small. Because they're going to understand that they need all those products and services. They're going to understand what those things cost. And now they'll be defending the allocations, not you. This is market economics in a nutshell, right here. Looking at money coming to this, this is the fundamental change in the way you think. Thinking of money not as something to cover your costs, but rather as revenues for your products and services. One more metaphor, just to really drive this one home. Imagine you go to the store, and the, the grocery store manager pulls you aside and says, OK, Sonica, here is your share of my rent, electricity, and checkout clerk. Fine. Now, here's a basket. Go help yourself to anything you could want in the store. That's how traditional budget processes work. It's pretty silly, isn't it? No, you go to the store and you buy produce and meat and dairy products. You buy products that have built into their price enough money to cover the rent and the electricity and the checkout clerk. That's market economics. So some implications. Cost control. It's not up to IT to control IT spending. It's up to IT to break even, that is, to deliver everything you pay us to deliver, to offer competitive rates, that is, be the best deal in town, to be a reliable source, a quality source, to invest in sustainability, that is, in infrastructure and innovation and training and so on, and to satisfy your customers with a great relationship and earn market share through performance. It's up to clients to live within their means and make wise purchase decisions. So we still have absolute cost control. We have frugality up here. IT must offer the best rates in town. And we have controls on total spending down here with clients having to live within the finite limits of their checkbook. I have a friend, Preston. He, he runs an IT shop. His revenues are just under a billion dollars. And he says it so beautifully. He says, I manage unit costs you manage volume. It's up to IT to be the best deal in town. 
from then on, everything else is demand management. So we have absolute cost control, just as good. In fact, better cost control than with traditional processes, but with accountability in the right place. Look at the implications for budgeting. Obviously, the idea is to submit a budget for what you want to sell, not what you want to spend. Let's negotiate the budget based on the needs of the business and the investment opportunities at hand, not last year plus or minus a few percent. So clearly, the budget should be a total of the rows, not just the columns. You want help desk 24 by 7 multilingual? Happy to do it. Here's the price. Oh, gee, you can't afford that business? Fine. What do you want to do? English only, 60 hours a week, whatever you want. We're happy to serve. It becomes a negotiation over the deliverables, not quibbling over how you spend your money. And that's the right kind of discussion to have. Now clients are going to perceive the value. In fact, clients will step forward and start defending their projects and their services. Yes, clients will automatically step forward and start defending the IT budget when you submit a budget for the rows, not just the columns. Sure, we can always total the columns, but you want to cut travel costs. Well, here's a project that has a lot of travel on it. Shall we kill that one? And that client steps forward and says, wait, I need that for this reason. And aren't they in a much better position to defend the budget than we are? They understand the impacts on the business, and they have the credibility to explain why they need it. Business budget decisions now are made based on ROI, on rationality, not politics. And we leave the budget with a crystal clear understanding of what it does and does not pay for in the way of deliverables, in the way of projects and services. Of course, to make this work, at the heart of all of this is a cost model which relates all of your costs to your products and services. That is which, now the direct costs are easy, but the bulk of our costs are indirect and support multiple sales, multiple projects, multiple services to multiple clients. So the, the idea of a cost model is to take all of your costs and associate them with those deliverables, both for the purpose of the budget and the rates that go in the catalog. This cost model is built once a year during the planning cycle because you've got to submit a budget in advance of the year and because you've got to publish your rates in advance of the year. So when we look at internal market economics, there are two major subsystems. There's the planning subsystem, which happens typically once a year in government. It's sometimes every other year. Some people do mid midterm updates. But let me just, for talking purposes, say it's annual. Once a year, you publish a catalog. You associate all your costs with the sales of those catalog items so that in the catalog, you can attach rates. Rates are unit costs, price per what? Price per hour, price per mailbox, and so on. And a budget for the rows as well as the columns, a budget for deliverables. By the way, that's called investment-based budgeting. Budget for the projects and services, the rows rather than the columns. Investment-based budgeting. That's done once a year in the planning cycle, so that's where the cost model is built. And then all through the year, all through the year, we're running governance processes that dynamically adjust priorities as the needs of the business change. So we're gathering up the costs of those services. We're presenting invoices. And I really don't mean showbacks in the sense of an invoice that goes nowhere. The invoice has to collect the money, whether it's from the clients directly, that is fee-for-service, or from one of those prepaid accounts produced by direct budget or allocations. Those are real invoices that decrement a checkbook, whether prepaid or not. And then that steering committee becomes a governance process for writing checks. Those are part of the actuals process. So planning subsystem, catalog, rates, budget, actual subsystem, tracking after the fact the cost of service, producing invoices or showbacks, and the priority setting processes. So Sonica, I'd like to ask the attendees another poll question, if I may. Sure. I'd Let like me to just... know what you all have been Which of these things has been the focus of your work to date on IT financial management and governance? Sonica? Okay, and uh, the audience now has about one minute. So remember, planning the once a year process to produce a catalog or revise a catalog, um, a catalog of the products and services that your customers actually buy, to associate rates with that catalog, and to submit a budget, hopefully, a 
budget for deliverables as well as the columns and the cost modeling that's behind both the rates and the budget. That's A. B, the actuals, that's cost of service tracking, taking actual um, utilization and turning it into cost of service, preparing invoices based on that data or showbacks, setting up dashboards about that data, and the priority setting or governance process that operates all year long. What have you been working on? Hello, Kadeen. The poll is closed now. What'd you get? Let me share the results. Predominantly, 80% uh, of the participants went with the second choice of actuals, tracking huh. service. And, you know, 57%, uh, um, I guess, a few of them answered both questions, said that planning also plays a role. Okay. Oh, that's not bad. That's not bad then. 57% are doing both, 80%. But there's another group of people that are focused only on the actual. All right. Okay. Well, does that make sense? Let's take a look. I'm going to show you a high-level map of all of the IT financial management resource governance processes. Well, almost all the main ones. And um, let's go through this map so that we understand how things should work. And then let's come back to that question of what are you working on? So it starts with the corporate budget process, which is owned by the CFO. I know we can't impact that di directly, but we can totally change the dialogue by submitting an investment-based budget, a budget for the rows as well as the columns. Yes, I understand we still have to upload the column totals at the end of the day into the, the uh, finance systems, but we need to be negotiating the rows and then uploading the columns. Once that's done, we can fill checkbooks with direct budget or with allocations. In, or in some cases, fee-for-service, the checkbooks remain with the client. Based on that, we set up a check-writing process, a governance process, where key decision makers know how much is in their checkbook over time and what the cost of the various options are for both projects and services and decide what checks to write. This is sometimes called portfolio management, but it's not application portfolio management. It's not project portfolio management. It's not service portfolio. What we're talking about here is investment portfolio management, kind of like your, your stock investments at home where you're your um, stockbroker like Schwab or whomever gave you a trading platform. It shows what you own. It shows how much cash you are. It shows the stocks you're watching. And you decide what checks to write. Of course, once you write a check, the IT department goes off and does it, delivers the service, fulfills the project. That's where PPM, uh, Project Portfolio Management, comes into play. That's where ITIL is critical, in service delivery. We deliver and we incur costs in doing so, costs which are captured in the general ledger, the financial actuals, but we can also capture actual utilization, hardware, software, time cards, and we can assemble all that into an invoice for the products and services actually delivered, and that invoice has to be used to decrement the checkbook. Fee for service, it's an actual journal transfer of money, but everything else, we've got to decrement those prepaid checkbooks so that our governance process knows how much is left for the rest of the year. This green is our basic money cycle. This goes on all year long. This is the actuals side. To make this work, the blue box is the planning subsystem, where we do a business plan. How can you do a budget if you don't know what's expected of you in the year ahead? So we begin with a business plan. And from there, produce the budget. And another view of that same data cube coming out of the cost model is the rates that go in the catalog. That investment-based budget is critical to shifting the dialogue with the business during the annual budget cycle. Knowing the cost of those deliverables is critical to deciding what checks to write. And those rates, the unit costs, are fundamental to invoicing. Because clearly, you want to invoice at published rates not actual cost. 
publish the rates. And then for invoicing, it's actual volume times published rates. You've got to live with your promise there. And you need to provide a stable environment for decision making out there in the business. So actual volume times published rates, which means you don't need a cost model here in the invoicing engine. The cost model is back in the blue box, the planning um, tool, where you come up with the rates in the first place. So there's a real high level view of what um, financial management and governance processes look like. And uh, what I heard was that um, far more of you are working on the green cycle, although I'm pleased that over half of you are working on the blue box, the planning cycle. So you said 57% A, 80% B. Now really, where should you start? Note that the blue box, the budget, and planning process is prerequisite to making the green cycle work. You can't have a sensible budget discussion without investment-based budgeting. You can't know what to do with your budget in terms of distributing it into checkbooks without investment-based budgeting. You don't know what it's intended to pay for. You can't have a sensible investment portfolio management or governance process without knowing the cost of those products and services at published rates. And you can't produce invoices unless you have published rates. So the green cycle will never work right. The actuals will never work right without an effective planning process and cost model built there. Furthermore, the planning process is not only prerequisite, but it's higher payoff. You get more value for far less effort and far less money fixing the planning process. That alone, it's the 80-20 rule. Um, for, you'll get 80% of the benefits of market economics doing the blue box for a fraction of the cost. Because the really expensive part, as perhaps many of you know, is in this utilization accounting and invoicing down in the lower right corner here. That's the expensive part. And it's not going to get you where you need to go unless it's hooked up in this whole cycle. And this whole cycle depends on effective catalog with rates and an investment-based budget. So when you look at it rationally from afar, it makes far more sense to begin with the business planning process and get that right, get a lot of benefits quickly for a relatively low cost, and then use that to go on to set up the green cycle that is the actual side. And even there, I would suggest that we hold off on the big costly piece of it, this lower right corner, and right away sort out checkbooks and establish a governance process. Because even if you're invoicing here at plan rather than actual, clients will get the message. They'll see what value they're getting. They'll take responsibility for living within their means. You'll have effective demand management even if you're invoicing a plan versus actual, which is not as accurate, but it'll work. And then you've bought yourself time and credibility to go spending down here in the lower right corner on the really expensive and difficult stuff, the utilization accounting and the invoices, to make those invoices more accurate. So my strategy, my suggested strategy, all else being equal, would be to start with the blue box, the planning cycle, then set up a governance process that shifts accountability to clients for demand management, and then you've got all the time in the world to improve the quality of your invoices through expenditures in the actuals accounting. I know that's counter to many people's intuition, counter to what the vendors are saying, especially the vendors down here in the lower right corner are saying. But from an objective outside point of view, that would be the strategy that makes sense. So. Um, I'm wondering, are you folks curious about what go, what's inside that blue book box, what the planning process is all about? Let me give you a peek, and then you can come back at me with questions. How does the blue box work? Here are the steps in the process. And um, if you're interested, um, contact me offline. We can drill down in more detail within each of these. But basically, it begins with the catalog. Each year, we define or refine the catalog. Then a business plan means what of that catalog do you plan to sell in the year ahead? 
That is a demand forecast, a sales forecast. What of that catalog do you plan to sell to each and every one of those client business units out there and to others within IT? So the catalog is both external and internal. I'm not talking about business catalog versus technical catalog. That whole concept doesn't make sense here. I'm talking about every entrepreneur at every level in IT has a catalog, whether their customers are internal or external. There are no second class citizens. Everybody is an entrepreneur. And everybody then is forecasting what of that they sell both to clients and internally. And by the way, most of those entrepreneurs sell to both audiences. Then based on that demand forecast, how are you going to go about fulfilling it? That's what business planning is about. What do you need in the way of people, both employees and staff augmentation contractors? What do you need in the way of vendor services, supplies and licenses, and so on, in order to deliver that demand forecast? That's where costs come into the planning process. And then we feed that through a cost engine, which associates all of the indirect costs with those sales. Now that cost engine could be the old simple ABC, activity-based costing, although there's a lot of danger in that. There are some gross distortions inherent in ABC that you ought to be aware of. Or it could be an advanced second generation cost engine. And for those of you who are really into cost modeling, come back and ask me about the difference. There's a white paper I can send you on the difference between ABC and second generation cost models. But somehow we associate all those costs with the sales of the products and services, the rows and the budget. And then we can take two views of that same data cube. One view is the budget view, and the other is rates, that is unit costs. So rate is price per what for each catalog item. Budget is rates times volume plus pass-throughs. So they're mathematically related. Said the other way, if we know the total cost of all those deliverables in the budget, to calculate rates, we remove the pass-throughs and total up all the cost, divide by forecasted volume, and we get a rate per unit. Two views of the same cost model. There's no need to do this twice and risk inconsistencies. So at a high level, that's what's inside the, the blue box, the business planning box. And with that, I'll take a breath and turn to you folks out there. What questions do you have? How can I help? Thanks, Dean. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, I'll start with uh, the first one, which, um, you know, uh, when you're talking about the planning process, um, how long do you think it takes to install a new planning process? Would you elaborate on that, please? The blue arrows. Um, I know you guys aren't going to like the answer to this, but the first time through, Let's say we have to develop the, the catalog from scratch. That's not too tough. And teach our leadership team to think like entrepreneurs, develop a business plan, and produce the budget and rates. First time through takes 10 months. Very reliable process. It always comes out about 10 months. We can do it with the leadership team engaged if your CIO understands that this is transformational, that it's really a strategic investment in transformation. Or we can do it them in the back room and check with them at key points along the way, which doesn't get the transformational effect. It gets the numbers, but not the impact on the way they think. But it may stand up a model which then proves to them the value of this whole approach, and we get them engaged next year. But whichever mode you do it, either as a fully engaged leadership team process or as an IT financial management process the first time through, 10 months is a good estimate. But then in future years, it doesn't take any longer than your conventional budget process, it's typically two or three months. Because look, what are you doing in future years? You're deleting some project deliverables that are done. You're adding some new ones in, um, both project and services. You're revising the numbers, and there you are. But you've got the basic model set up. So about 10 months first time, two or three months each year thereafter for a normal business planning process. So you'd say while working on a service catalog, how long w would that take? And how would we know that we've got it right? Oh, excellent. OK, so the first step here is the service catalog. And I said if this whole process is 10 months, then that's the easy step. How long would that take? Um, from nothing to a world-class service catalog for the purpose of 
governance about two months. And there are two steps to it. The first step is um, before you even begin the service catalog, we take your organization chart and deconstruct it into the lines of business underneath each of your managers. And that's really critical. We use the structural cyber cybernetics framework, a list of all the lines of business that exist in an organization. And in fact, Sonica, I think you still have online my prior webinar on structural cybernetics. So I cover yes. all of those lines of business there. That's still up online, Sonica? Yes, it is. It's, under, uh, it's on our events page under archived events. OK. So we use that framework of structure, deconstruct all the lines of business under each manager. Because if you don't know what business you're in, it's pretty tough to do a catalog, wouldn't you say? And also, we want to very clearly associate every item in the catalog with a manager who's accountable for delivering it. So we start with the org chart view, understand the lines of business, and then within each of those lines of business under each manager, um, we work with them to generate a catalog. Now, there, um, as to what makes a good one versus a bad one, how do we know if we've got it right? Every entry in that catalog has to speak with, to what we sell, not what we do. This is the one most important point. It's what does the customer own or consume, not what do we do to make it. So don't be distracted by what you pay your vendors, or don't be distracted by the processes you use or the tasks you do. They focused on that mantra. What does my customer, internal or external, what does my customer own or consume? As to granularity, if you're going for demand management, it has to be at the level of the discrete purchase decision. You can't go with just high-level service portfolios. Like, you don't go to the grocery store and buy the produce aisle or the meat aisle. You buy specific products and services, specific SKUs, SKUs, in a store. So to get this right, you can't be afraid of diving down to that level of granularity. Sure, you can summarize it back up to a service portfolio level. Service portfolio is like the table of contents of the catalog. But the catalog has to be down to the level of decisions people can choose to buy or not buy. There's a whole, whole bunch more guidelines. In fact, we published three pages of guidelines. They're very clearly worded that say, here's how you go about service catalog. But the bottom line is, it's not rocket science. We have templates that you can uh, start with. Um, two, two and a half months should be sufficient start to finish for a world-class service catalog. More questions, Sonica? Um, Dean, going back to uh, the second um, poll question that uh, we had sent out to the audience, for those who, uh, you know, went with option A, the planning stage, mm. how do they get the buy-in of their finance department? And um, would they need permission from the CEO to change their internal economy? Or the CFO? Mm. Oh, sorry, sorry, the CFO, Chief Financial I'll Officer. tell you that of the CIOs and leadership teams I've worked with, very few have waited until the CFO approved this change. There's an old Jesuit saying, better to ask for, uh, better to beg forgiveness than ask permission. They just do it. Because remember, we can always total the columns and comply with whatever finance is asking of us in the way of traditional GL codes by cost center. The thing is to explain what that number pays for in terms that are meaningful to the business. So I can't think of any who were successful waiting for CFO to approve before they moved ahead. And in fact, Hey, just between us, I've seen a lot of finance departments that are resistant to this because, I don't know, maybe they think transparency is working against them. It's reducing their power or something. Um, but um, I wouldn't advise waiting on that. I, I think um, a CIO and, and lead, IT leadership team have every right to press on and explain what the numbers that they're getting does and does not pay for. Now, that may or may not change the way finance does the allocations or the budget process, but it will, at a minimum, explain what the business can expect in the way of products and services for a given level of funding. And it becomes the basis, then, for moving toward the business within a business paradigm. So my suggestion is this is an IT decision. It's the way we want to plan our business. Don't call it a finance process, per se. It's a business planning process that leads to our budget submission, both in the traditional format for finance 
and totaling the rows for discussion with the business. And um, power on, and I think finance will then come around when clients see the value of it. Monica? Sounds good, Dean. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation, and I thank all our audience for joining us. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed and gained from this webinar. Your feedback is appreciated as we continually strive to improve upon what we deliver to our members. You may send your feedback to our webmaster. Our next webinar on helping successful leaders get even better is scheduled for May 27th. Please visit our events page at ciindex.com to sign up. As mentioned earlier, this webinar is being recorded. You will be able to access the recording through our events page at CIO Index under our archived events. Thank you, Dean, and thank you all. Have a great day. Bye, all.